I've heard you tell the story uh, quite often about um, how you, you sort of got your start in guitar. You're 14 years old. You had this moment of epiphany with Andre Segovia. Um, yeah. And and then later, you know, after starting to study classical music, you had a second moment where you were listening to Mississippi John Hurt and mm -hmm. discovering that style. Um, I'm wondering if, um, you know, you've had since then any other moments where something hit you like a, a lightning rod and you, and you said, oh, I, I've got to change, I've got to adapt my playing now that I know about this? A series of kind of sm small epiphanies. Once, once you become epiphanized, uh, you start finding it everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and you start finding s similar kinds of things that, that speak to, to your, your way of looking at the world. Um, I loved uh, when I discovered Debussy, his, mm -hmm. his uh, piano preludes. Uh, was, was a real eye-opener for me because there was uh, a whole different sense of narrative to the pieces. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just impressionism, he resisted that term. It was that he was putting you in the spirit of the thing itself. And that really uh, had a profound effect on me. Um, and uh, ever since I was a kid, I was, I've been reading uh, this old ancient Chinese poetry. Mm. And uh, when you say the word poetry, people conjure up a little puffy shirts and you know, a glass of cognac, you know. Uh, but this stuff is real Zen stuff, real potent, powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and what I really liked about it was that it was uh, fairly spare in terms of how much language was used, but really potent in, into what was what the language was suffused with. It was uh, powerful images and references and uh, Zen states of being and, and, and statement of condition. Um, and that got me to really thinking about uh, trimming away all the stuff that I didn't feel was really necessary to, to help me deliver a potent message. Mm -hmm. So that sense of potency and, and spareness really affected me. So that's kind of why I, I play the way I play, because that, that's the, just the way I like to see things. That economy of uh, you know, the notes. and mm -hmm. Yeah. I love to hear all the fast, furious stuff, but it just never occurs to me. Any, I used to play that kind of stuff, too, and, and it just never occurs to me any, anymore to play like that. I, I, I enjoy keeping things, uh, and simple is not the, really the correct word for it, but keeping things open, open and allowing things to develop so that you can hear a foreground and background and feel the subtext, you know? Mm -hmm. If you put too many notes in there, uh, everything sort of becomes one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And so I like more of a, a 4D kind of thing. When you became a professional guitarist, um, did that, you know, when you, you're out on the road and you've got a touring schedule, did that change how you approached practicing the guitar, or or were you, you know, did you have to practice continually and, and more on top of the the touring schedule? Uh, I don't ever consider what I do practicing. I do play a lot, but yeah, it's affected the uh, performing has affected the way I uh, do everything, mm -hmm. um, because I I really think that in any art, it really relies on some sense of an audience, or in my case, an audience, you know, mm -hmm. uh, including myself as, right. a, as a member. Uh, because it, it uh, knowing that it's going to be received or, or feeling that it's going to be received, uh, it forces you to, to grapple with the issue of delivery. How mm -hmm. am I going to put this across? Mm -hmm. So it's not just the composition or the tone or how good the guitar sounds, but how am I going to make a persuasive and potent message? Tell me about your first time that you were performing um, in front of an audience or an audience. Um, what what was that? Uh, what was that occasion? Can you set that scene for us? Do you remember your first time? Yeah, it was in a little uh, coffee house in a church basement in uh, Lansdale, Pennsylvania, and I was just petrified. I was really nervous, uh, n literally knees knocking, and and uh, you know, my armpits were fountains. You know, it was just really uh, it was horrible. Uh, but there was something about it that was exhilarating at the same time. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, that I was seeking attention or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, the, the outpouring was something that was the only uh, venue for me to do that was, was through music. Well, you get that immediacy with the audience. Yeah. Too, so. Well, I mean, it's a, a bunch of horny teenagers, you know, <laughs> over-caffeinated and eating donuts, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> there were other things more important than me up there. But uh, for me, it was just really the, the fact that I was able to go out there and, and play something and get all the way through a piece. Uh, I got hooked on that. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, the, it wasn't it wasn't the attention or and you know I, you know I was uh, what, like 14, 15 years old I think. Mm -hmm. um, so you know there was there was no great uh, earth shaking art taking place there. Mm -hmm. But the experience really galvanized me. Um, 
And I just knew from that moment on that, that yeah, that I'm going to figure out how to do this. Uh, tell me about um, the, the guitars you brought in today. Um, you have a long-standing uh, relationship with Breedlove. Yeah. And um, so tell me about this one that you're you're touring with here today. This is a Revival Series Dreadnought. It's a sort of a custom Revival Series. Um, it's an Adirondack spruce top, Adirondack braces. I believe they're forward shifted braces. Um, and uh, quilted sapele back and sides, or sapele, I'm not sure how they like to pronounce it, which is similar to a mahogany. It's a West African wood. And it's just spectacular. You know, I, I, most of my guitars are fairly utilitarian and, and fairly, you know, you know, I'm not crazy about all the blingy looking wood, but when I saw this stuff, uh, in the pile, I got to pick out the wood with uh, Jason Bowerman when he was at Bree Love. And we got about halfway through the pile, and when I saw this stuff, I just didn't want anybody else to have it. Right. <laughs> so we got this. Um, it's a real straightforward, it's a blood wood binding, mm -hmm. uh, nothing too mm -hmm. fancy, no inlay on the, on the fretboard. Mm -hmm. um, I like that because guitar players can't figure out what you're doing. You know? and they, they have no dots. To, of course, I got dots on the side, so I can see what I'm doing. There you go. But I like a very simply appointed guitar. Then, then again, I like a D45 too. You know, I, I really like them all. Uh, and this guitar, I wasn't expecting to like it as much as I as I do. It, uh, I just wanted kind of a straight up, you know, mahogany dreadnought for the studio, a good utility guitar. Uh, it's got really great range. It's got really good sustain. Mm -hmm. I can get any kind of tone I want out of it. It really has served me. But I've got it in 2009, and it's it's been my main guitar ever since. I love it. And let's look, look over at the slide. Here. This guitar was made by Jason Bowerman when he was at uh, Breedlove. Um, we'd been talking about doing a Weisenborn thing for a couple of years, and the time wasn't right. And finally, the time was right. So uh, Jason made a, a prototype, and it was it was incredible. So uh, and normally a Weisenborn is made from koa. Mm -hmm. This one is made from myrtle wood, which has a much different sound than koa. The, the koa is very quick and explosive. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is not quite as uh, explosive sounding, but it's got a, a great deal of sustain and, mm -hmm. and richness to it. And, and I can get a, a rounder tone off of the Myrtle than I can from uh, many of the Koa Weisenborns I have. Mm -hmm. um, you get back and sides. I mean, look at that. It's just, it's crazy how pretty that is. Yeah. And uh, how old were you when you started playing a Weisenborn? 40-something? Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I've always played slide guitar. And every time I've been around a Weisenborn, I noodle around with the thing, but it never really got me until one day I just heard one. I said, you know, because I, I, I never wanted to learn how to play lap style. All right, this is a, a brief excerpt and a little bit of improvisation on a, a great old tune called I Am a Poor Wayfaring Stranger. <laughs>
there been you know nightmare uh, occasions when you've been touring and you've, you've just gotten someplace and the sound has just been you know near unacceptable or uh, in no your no <laughs> yeah of course it's yeah <laughs> um, you have to be prepared to to counteract um, almost any situation you run into on the road and so I find I bring uh, some di boxes that have some EQ in them mm -hmm. I also have uh, been bringing like a Swiss Army knife literally the condition of things is deteriorating. It's in a steady state of decline. So you often have to f repair things. Like what kind of things would you repair? Let's with say you? I have a vocal mic, and the clip on the vocal mic, there's a big screw in there, and that's always loose or been duct taped down. Uh, and I say, hey, can we get a screwdriver to fix this? And in the 45 minutes it takes for the guy to say, well, I think Earl's got one in the desk, but his office is locked. <laughs> I got my Swiss Army knife out, and it's fixed. You, know? <laughs> uh, you have to be prepared for this kind of stuff. Um, and I talk to other musicians about this, and, and you'll often hear them complaining about how, oh, that place was really unprofessional. But if you're not prepared to prevail every time, then you're the one that's unprofessional, you know? So I'm, I'm ready to go at, at a moment's notice. All yeah. my stuff is packed, my tools are clean and sharp, I have extra strings and batteries, you know, I mean... You're, uh, you're prepared. I'm a fully rocking unit, man. 